Okay. Um, it is my pleasure to present to you Mr. Rod Collier, who is the designer of the uh, Letterman Building, and will be talking, and his talk is entitled, BSU Sets the New Standard. Please welcome Rod. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm actually on campus quite a bit. I was very fortunate to be the design architect and the project manager for the David Letterman Building here on the campus. Um, I've also continued forward and I'm working on the Student Wellness and Recreation Facility, which is under construction next door. And I will be doing the student boiler or the campus boiler plant um, down in the old quad, another project coming up. And then uh, there's a couple more that I'm not allowed to talk about yet. So um, that's fine. One thing I wanted to kind of show, and um, a few people have touched on this before, you know, it's before LEED and before USGBC, Ball State was doing really great things. Um, they were already green before green was popular. And uh, it wasn't just my generation, it was the generations before me. And uh, you've heard people talk about that today. And I think that's a very important thing to point out that the College of Architecture and Planning really has been on the forefront of the Green Revolution. So um, this little fly through skit thing that I've shown is just more um, to kind of dedicate that the university really has gone forward. So a um, little bit about my company. Um, MSKTD and Associates is based out of Fort Wayne. I actually am currently out of the Indianapolis office. We celebrate our 30th anniversary this year, which is a pretty good milestone. Um, we focus on higher education and healthcare. Um, but we do have many other divisions within the company. And uh, we're currently about 80 plus employees, which I think is a pretty good size. Um, we don't really want to get too much bigger, but uh, Indianapolis office is really great. It's a small little um, design division. It's more 11 employees, all architects, um, all with more design background. So um, I actually worked out of the Fort Wayne office for 10 years, and then three years ago moved to the Indianapolis office during the actual process of the Letterman building. So it was kind of a transition to get closer to my project as well. Um, I am a 1996 graduate. Um, I have been with the company even before I graduated from um, Ball State. I was working with MSKTD. So I've been there over 13 years currently. Um, and I've had lots of clients um, at many different universities. And uh, I'm, I'm primarily focused at this point in higher education, um, although I do healthcare whenever I'm needed. Uh, my focus is primarily design. I don't typically do um, project administration, but uh, the Letterman building was just a little bit different than your typical project, so I didn't let go. Um, look at the timeline for the Letterman building. Um, clear back in 2003, we really started going to the state for funding. It's actually even before my company was given the um, commission. Uh, we did the initial design uh, proposal to go to state for funding, and then after we did the interviews, um, we, we started the design. So we had about a year and a half of design. Um, with this being the very first lead-oriented um, project for the university, um, there was a learning curve. So we had to educate ourselves, we had to educate the university, and ultimately we had to educate the contractor as well. So um, all three of us really had this initial confrontation with lead um, with this project. So. Um, we had a, a couple years of design. Um, clear back in the middle of, of 2003, uh, SketchUp wasn't really a big program at that point, but I started using it with this project. Um, since that point, I've actually gone on to design and build the entire campus in SketchUp. So um, it's definitely a tool I use frequently and uh, has, I think, helped me get some of the commissions around the campus because I do have a pretty good understanding of how this university looks and works. Um, the bidding phase was right at the turn of, of 2005. Uh, we very quickly started construction in um, March of 2005, and it lasted all the way through September of 2007. Um, and then, of course, at the very end, uh, Ball State University actually adopted a new strategic plan, um, which will strive that all buildings should move forward with at least lead silver, if at all possible, um, which I think is just an amazing thing. 
Um, from my standpoint, having worked with IU and having worked with Purdue, um, they are definitely behind the curve when it comes to LEED certification. Um, the project that I'm currently working on um, at Purdue, when we first started that project, they wanted nothing to do with LEED. Um, they didn't like the whole concept of having to be held accountable for something, and that to them was a lot more work than they needed to go through, so it was not even out on the table. Um, IU's definitely come around. They are now pursuing LEED with most, most projects, but Ball State was definitely ahead of the curve on that one, and uh, I think it's a great thing that, that the university has done. Um, and then, of course, at the very end, the big thing, I don't know how many of you were here, but the David Letterman dedication was kind of just icing on the cake. Um, in his style, I had to do the Letterman Top Ten. Um, talking more about what's green about the Letterman building. Um, the materials, um, obviously that's one of the, the typical uh, choices you can make towards LEED. Um, with this building, we, we definitely went for longevity. Um, they wanted a building that was a 50 to 100 year building, so you look for materials that are gonna last. Um, and not become outdated or not become worn out. So terrazzo floors, stone, steel, you know, your typical materials that have long-term uh, durability um, were, were, were very good for this building. We also went for some of the green materials. You know, the, the whole building is, uh, wherever you see wood, it's bamboo. Um, you know, there's the whole controversy as to whether bamboo is really a green material because you're shipping it from China. Well it grows back in five to six years, so you've got this offset with that. So everything we used in the building was bamboo, wherever it's visible. Even the custom mill work that we did in all of those uh, acoustic studios was custom milled out of bamboo. Um, our doors are actually veneered in bamboo, which was the first time that uh, uh, Marshfield Door, which is one of the largest manufacturers of doors, um, had ever done that. Bamboo was a very exotic material to them, and they were very excited by it. Um, unfortunately, we actually had to go through two sets of doors to get it right, but what you see in that building is, is the first bamboo sets of doors that uh, Marshfield had ever done, and now it's going to become, I think, one of their standards. So. Um, high efficiency systems, most of that is just mechanical systems, um, lighting systems. We kind of took the university standard to the next level when it came to mechanical systems. Um, it's a very, very sophisticated system not only for um, you know, energy efficiency, but also because this building has so many acoustic um, issues with being a studio-oriented, um, very much isolation from everything, so you have very sophisticated systems that don't generate noise. They also go through, and there's UV emitters that kill off any bacteria, so what you're getting through that building is a very clean air um, and a very quiet system as well. So, um, Low VOC, this is almost a given anymore. Um, when you have to think back though, to when we started this in 2003, uh, 2004, materials were not as readily available as they are now. So um, the choices we had when we were designing this building were, were much more limited. I love what I'm seeing now on all the new buildings that we get to work on. Um, you know, we can choose so many more materials that are green friendly. Um, you have to look for actual green washing, which I think is one of the problems right now. But if you actually delve in and look at a material, you can really tell if it truly is um, a, a green material. Um, and for this building, we, of course, went for everything that we possibly could that was low VOC or, or recycled content wherever possible. Um, commissioning and monitoring, um, I think that's one of the really good benefits of LEED. Um, it's one of the reasons I really push clients, if at all possible, to go after it. Um, you know, some of the discussions we've had here, uh, listened to earlier, we're kind of talking about, you know, to LEED or not to LEED. Um, I think one of the really strong benefits is actually the commissioning process. Um, going through and finding things that you wouldn't necessarily see during construction, um, whether it's a motor that's wired backwards on a fan uh, unit, you would never know that because the fan is running, but it's actually running backwards. We actually have that on the Letterman building, and it's pretty typical on most buildings that there's something wrong, but you wouldn't necessarily catch it unless you're going through this monitoring and, and commissioning system. So. Um, I think that's one of the strong points for, uh, for LEED. Obviously, furniture and equipment. Um, Ball State University is really great with uh, most furniture. Uh, Dan Stevenson with facilities here at the university 
um, worked with Steelcase, which is a great environmental company, um, to uh, work with me. And uh, together, I think we came up with some really great furniture for that building that is all recyclable or recycled material. So it's, it's definitely got a, a, you know, an evolution to the material and the, the process. Um, one thing in that building that, that is, I think, pretty unique, every office has its own zone, so they can control their own temperature, they can control their own lights. Um, that's not very typical for most universities. They have big systems that control huge zones throughout the building, but this building actually has multiple small zones. Natural light, I think this is probably the biggest thing for me in this building. Um, obviously with the atrium cutting through the entire building, it allowed us to get light deep into that, that structure. Um, and after this really brief lecture, we're gonna walk over and take a really quick tour of the building. Um, you can ask me questions about it over there. But I think one of the things that most people immediately pick up on is the amount of natural light in that space. Um, and it's, it's prevalent throughout the entire building in almost every space. Water conservation, um, we're I think at this point about 40% on that building um, more efficient than your typical building. Um, we have the, your typical waterless urinals, low flow regulators on everything. Um, one of the things I do like to point out, because most people didn't get to see it on the day of the dedication, um, somebody went through and actually put Jay Leno in every waterless urinal, which I thought was a really funny thing. Um, waste management, um, this is one thing that I have to give the university absolute kudos for. Um, we actually achieved 98% of our waste, water, or waste coming out of this building being recycled. Um, that's almost unheard of. To get to 75% is a real struggle for a lot of uh, contractors. The university actually is the one who was in charge of this and they went above and beyond. So to get to 98% is just huge. And then probably the greenest thing was actually Mr. Letterman writing an eight figure check to the university. Uh, that's a lot of green, and uh, he didn't do that to get his name on the building, which I really commend him for. Um, in fact, uh, from everything I know and from everything I've heard from um, his mother, it was not something he wanted at all. He did not want his name on this building. Um, he didn't want his name on any university building, but um, Dorothy actually toured the building three times during construction and really pushed him at the end to put his name on that building. So it's kind of the icing on the cake. Some of the things we didn't get for the building, um, I did want to talk about that. You know, it is a pretty green building and we're on track to, to achieve a high lead silver status. Um, we looked at solar power for the building. Uh, photovoltaics were just very, very expensive. Um, and because of Indiana's uh, lack of, of sunlit days, it really wasn't an option that was going to pay itself back over the lifetime of this building. I think it actually went beyond the lifetime of this building to pay it off. So it, it really very quickly became a non-option. We did go ahead and, and size the structure of parts of the roof where we would have put those solar arrays. So if down the road technology catches up and the cost comes down, we can come in and actually mount those, the structures designed for them. So the green roof, um, I fought really hard for the green roof. Um, we, we have actually tried on other buildings around the campus to get green roofs. Um, it's not something a university wanted to pursue. I can understand from one, st one standpoint that right now their whole goal is to kill anything that's trying to grow on a roof. Why would they want to actually try and grow something on a roof? Um, there are a couple roofs over there that I think would have been absolutely perfect because you can see them from the interior. They would have been really great spaces for a very natural look. Um, it's just not, not an option for the university at this point. I'll keep pushing for every project that comes forward, but for the Letterman building, it, it uh, was, was put off the table pretty quick. So. We actually looked at collecting all of the rainwater from the roof, bringing it down through the system and holding it in some pretty large cisterns down in the, the basement. Um, when we ran the calculations as to maintenance and treatment of the water, um, it was about 102 year payoff at that point. So the university said that really wasn't economically feasible and I can understand that. So um, because of how tight the, the site was, 
we really didn't have a lot of options putting it anywhere else, so I can understand why they didn't want that in the building. So. Composting toilets, uh, we actually looked at that. Um, we got the waterless urinals, and I'll say that we barely got the waterless urinals, um, but we actually did look at composting toilets, which would have completely eliminated a lot of the water coming out of this building. Um, just the, the word composting completely took it off the table for the university. Um, even though we, we looked at some universities that have done it out um, in the Northwest and have done it very well, um, Ball State really wasn't quite there yet. So. Uh, recycled brick, we have some brick on the interior that actually acts as kind of a thermal collection. Um, the sun comes in, heats them up, radiates it out overnight. Um, we originally were going to use all recycled brick on that interior wall, but um, recycled brick really isn't very consistent in appearance. <laughs> so when we did the mock-up during construction, um, it was very quickly deemed that that was not a material that they wanted on the inside of the building. So um, recycled brick comes from many different buildings. You end up with 10 different colors and 10 different sizes. And so it just really wasn't something that looked polished and clean like the rest of the building. So that was, was taken out of the equation. Um, one thing I'm just really going to quickly show, um, you know, I worked on this project for four and a half, five years of my life. Um, it pretty much consumed me and, and I love this building. Um, so during my slow Letterman days that I was working on this, um, I actually, actually also decided to go ahead and design my own house and build it. Um, this is a, a cover of a magazine that the house was on. But um, I took a lot of the same principles I learned through the Letterman experience and uh, put them into my own home. So a lot of the same materials were used, a lot of the same solar orientation, things that I factored in throughout construction. I actually learned how to do this for my own home. So there was just a whole series of um, quick little photos that I wanted to show and, and kind of say, you can even cascade this down onto a much smaller scale. Um, and, and pull things in that, that you typically wouldn't use, but you know, I used commercial carpets, I used low VOC paints, I actually had a builder that was green friendly, understood the whole concept. Um, this was before LEED actually had residence, or the LEED home category. I would have loved to have done my home and actually had it go through LEED home, but they were just starting, um, it started right after my home was constructed, so I missed it. Um, the reason I pointed out is the American Institute of Architects in Indianapolis is going to have the house on their tour on October 4th and 5th. So if you can make it to Indianapolis and want to see the house, come on down. Um, there's actually eight homes on the tour that, that day, so it's a, a pretty exciting tour. So with that, if you want to ask some questions, we can answer them here, or I can uh, take you over and show you the building. Um, are there any questions? He asked if I'm still working on the certification process. Yes, that is one thing about LEED. It's not a quick process. Um, it's an even slower process when the contractor um, decides that they are really tired of it and don't want to keep moving. So you have to keep kicking. And uh, so we are, we are still on track to get a, a, a LEED Silver certification, um, but we're in the process of, of moving that forward. And you still have to document. Um, and we're in the LEED 2.1 category, so it's kind of the old generation of LEED, um, which I think is even slower because now you've got everything that you can do online and it's much quicker and much easier to pull information and materials. And, um, so we're, we're kind of still moving this project forward. Any other questions? Well, you're welcome to join me on a tour. Okay. Uh, just one uh, small, small uh, announcement before uh, is that we will have sessions back uh, here at 3.30. And uh, I think there's a little coffee break happening outside yes. as well and yes. then uh, the visit. But first, why don't we thank uh, Rod for his presentation. Thank you. And we'll see you back.